Uh, that's for me. Uh, that's not for you. So, uh, but I won't be very long uh, in this message. I, I do want to bring it just very uh, simple and simplistic to you, um, and 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 just hopefully that we can kind of get something from it. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity to say uh, good morning to each of you. Uh, I am just delighted uh, any time that I can come before uh, God's people uh, and, and just share a little of the word. Uh, it is certainly indeed an honor um, to be, uh, to have the, the Lord as the guest um, uh, for our worship uh, because he is worthy uh, to be praised. Uh, someone ought to say amen right there. Uh, he's worthy to be praised. And as I recall, I, I think uh, um, you know, you slept and slumber on last night, and um, you didn't wake yourself up for that long flight they wake you up. Um, God saw fit uh, to touch you with his finger of love, and uh, you were able to have blood flowing in your body. Uh, you were able to put one foot before the other, uh, to, to step out with, with the readiness of mind to want to worship him this morning in spirit and in truth. Uh, again, I just uh, want to say, um, you know, to my lovely wife of uh, over 26 years, I, I want to thank her um, just being here with me. Uh, it is certainly a pleasure. Uh, she is a gift from God. Uh, and I thank her and I pray for her every opportunity that I have. Uh, it is certainly a blessing to have our children, uh, Michael and Michael, with us. Um, uh, we hadn't been together in, in some time, uh, all together. Uh, it's been a little bit here and there, and as you know, both of them are in school, and uh, we're just so thankful for, for them and um, things that they have shown. And um, uh, Michael has a guest with her, Jabari, all the way from Pennsylvania, uh, to be here. So we're just so thankful uh, for them, and uh, certainly to uh, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, aunts and uh, cousins and the nieces. Now, if you hear that little one, uh, she's going to be hollering because she may recognize that I'm, that I'm up here and she may want to do a little preaching too uh, as well. Uh, but, but, you know, I just, um, I just want to bring you greetings uh, from the Susan Road Church of Christ. Um, um, the congregation is uh, there in uh, Maryland, uh, right there in Susan, Maryland where our minister is uh, Brother Ed Maxwell, a senior. Uh, you know, certainly if you're traveling through the District of Columbia, uh, we certainly invite you uh, to be with us. We're just centrally located right outside of the district. Uh, you all know where that is, where all of that chaos is going on. Um, you know, certainly we, uh, we appreciate having uh, those three uh, branches of government, um, you know, where we have that 115, uh, do very little Congress, and um, you know we've got that jurisprudence, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, and then we have uh, that House of Chaos, you know, also known as the White House. We we have that there with all of the uh, iconic monuments: uh, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, uh, Dr. King, and, and now the Multicultural Museum. Certainly a wonderful place to to visit. Uh, but, but, but don't get caught up in the chaos uh, because there's chaos everywhere. You can't look for answers in that kind of chaos. Um, you know, you need to be looking for spiritual uh, answers. That's in the Word of God. Uh, so don't get caught up in that chaos. You know, sometimes you can't look to uh, Mama Nam and uh, Madea in uh, uh, Big Mama's house. Uh, you can't look at the State House. Uh, no, even the White House. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, it's hard to find the answer in some of these uh, church houses. Uh, so, uh, but you need to look to the Word of God and what He has prepared uh, in His message here. Uh, and as we move uh, closer uh, to trying to understand uh, some of the things that we are going to try to cover, um, you know, I'm going to need a reader just a little bit uh, as we go uh, into this, um, uh, Brother Bishop. Um, so I'm going to pretty much just kind of stay um, in Romans 
Um, and um, and then there, there may be other another uh, chapter that I uh, or a, a a book that I would like for you to read and, and to go forward as we move forward here. So um, the scripture that was read in the hearing, uh, Romans uh, 7, 23 through 25. If I'm permitted, I'd like to start around verse 14. Reading from the King James Version, the Bible says, For well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. But that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Is that in your Bible? Verse 17, now then, it is no more I, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that would I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwell in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law in my mind, and bringing me to the law of sin, rather bringing me into captivity, to the law of sin, which I which is in my members. Verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, there was a sitcom. It was called The Flip Wilson Show. Anybody remember that? And Flip Wilson used to play various characters. And one of the characters that he played was Geraldine. Anybody remember? What was the favorite line that Geraldine, well, one of them, she had uh, several, but one of the favorite lines that Geraldine would say is the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. I stopped by this morning to tell you that the devil doesn't have the power to make you do it. As we go on to watch and chronicle the life here of Paul. See, for those Bible scholars, if you need a preposition or an argument, my argument this morning is that Paul 
is chronicling his life as a Christian and not an unbeliever. Let me say that again. Paul is talking about his life as a Christian instead of an unbeliever. Paul wrote the Roman epistle in lieu of taking a trip to Rome. He was in Corinth, and the circumstances prevented him to go to Rome. Chapter 15, verse 25. So instead of this personal visit, Paul explained the things that he would otherwise have told them in person, he put it in a letter. See, through God's providence, Paul's inability, inability to visit Rome, see, he gave the whole world this inspired, glorious masterpiece of the gospel. See, Paul's primary purpose in writing Romans was to teach great truths of the gospel of grace to Christians who had never received the apostolic instructions. See, the letter introduced Paul to the church where he was personally unknown, but he hoped to visit soon, but some important reasons came up while he was in Corinth, dealing with the church at Corinth, and couldn't get to Rome. See, Paul wanted to let them know in this letter, he wanted to edify or lift up Christians. He wanted to preach the gospel, chapter 1, verse 15. He wanted to get to know the Roman Christians. See, Paul wanted to encourage them, and then he also wanted the Christians to encourage him. Somebody else say amen this morning. See, Paul wanted Christians to help him in his upcoming ministry. See, Paul didn't write this epistle because he wanted to give them some theological lesson. He didn't write this epistle because he wanted to rebuke the church of how they were living. Hmm. Paul inserted himself in the scriptures to be an example to the Christians. He wanted them to encourage him as he encouraged them. So this morning, just for a brief moment, I want to speak to you from the sermonic thought of unmasking the Christian. Unmasking the Christian. Seeing me as God sees me. Seeing me as God sees me. See, this morning there's some practical instructions we all can receive if we take off our masks. See, if we are open and honest with one another, because God knows our heart, right? Did Did Paul say that the Spirit itself making intercessions for us, our groanings, which cannot be uttered? See, this morning I've got three theological observations that I want to speak to. The transference of mankind. Number two, the sanctification of Christians. And then lastly, I want to speak to the justification by sovereignty of God. See, the transference of mankind began with Adam. See, when sin plunged everyone into the evils which brings down God's wrath on us. See, first you look at the definition, transference. If we look at Webster, we'll find that transference is a theoretical phenomenon characterized by unconsciously redirection of feelings of one person to another. See, transference was described first by the psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud. <coughs> See, he considered it important as part of his treatment. 
psychoanalysis. See, this was a phenomenon in psychotherapy in which there is an unconscious redirection of feelings from one person to another. See, Paul's discussion of the propitiation of Adam's sin is one of the deepest, most profound theological passages of Scripture. See, God in his infamous wisdom allowed nature of mankind's union with Adam and how his sin was transferred to the human race. See, because God created the world, all Christians ought to be able to know how and who to worship. See, God simply is not just based on nature. Watch what he says. Paul says in Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power, God did, so that they are without excuse. Man has no excuse about how to worship God, irregardless of how nature and mankind and sin was transferred to mankind, you still is supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. See, see, Paul delivers his information about creation. It's clear. It's unmistakable. God's person, he's more than just the eternal power that we see in that. See, as we deal with the creator who made all things around us and constantly sustains it, he, you, you can tell that he must be an awesome God. Is he not? See, the Godhead in his divine nature, he's more than just having eternal power. His faithfulness, Genesis 8, 21. His kindness, his graciousness, Acts 14, 17. See, the Bible says that there are without excuse. See, God holds all men responsible for their refusal to acknowledge what he has shown us in himself, in his creation. See, God provides the means for every person to hear the gospel. Acts 8, 26. Acts 1, um, 10, 1 through 48, and Acts 17, 27. See, this morning I need the Christians to take off your religious mask. I need you to see me, and I need to see you as God sees you. See, Paul wants to make it certain to the readers. He don't want you to think that the law is evil, because it's not. He needs you to see that the law reveals the divine standard. And it's not your own. So you can't have a standard for me. And I have a standard for you. Paul wants you to see the word of God as his standard. He uses it as a standard for his life. And even today, we need to use it as a standard for our own life. See, some problems today with some of our Christians is that we compare our righteousness with others. See, that's our standard. Well, you know, I'm not doing as bad as so-and-so. Oh, you know, I'm not living like he lives. You know, and, and, and then in the other sense, we turn around and gospel about other things creating a standard for that other individual. See, Paul is using his life. He's not talking about the church of Rome. He's not talking about how you're doing some ungodly things. He's not comparing the church at Rome with the church at Corinth. He's talking 
about his life. He's being open and honest about his life. See, when you unmask yourself as a Christian, you're open, you're honest, and you're vulnerable. Amen. See, you can't be a saint in the street and a sinner in the house. Hmm. Hmm. Sunday mornings can't be your masquerade party. Sunday mornings can't be that mask where you hide behind that nice suit you wear. That nice outfit that you wear. That beautiful hat sometimes you wear. See, we have to be open and honest and vulnerable with one another because that's how God sees us. Paul uses the personal pronoun throughout the chapter. He is using his own experience as an example. What is true about the unredeemed mankind, verse 7 through 12, and then he talks about the true Christian, verse 13 through 25. See, some try to interpret the chronicle of Paul's inner conflict as describing his life before he became a Christian. See, they point out Paul describes his person's soul of sin, verse 14. They try to use nothing is good in him, verse 18. They try to use old wretched man trapped in the body of death, verse 24. Those descriptions seem to contradict the way Paul describes the believer in chapter 6. See, it is correct to understand Paul here is speaking about a Christian. See, this person desires to obey Christ, God's law, but they hate their sin. Verse 15, 19, and 21. See, that person is humble, but yet they recognize that nothing is good dwells in their flesh. Verse 16, rather verse 18. See, that person sees sin in their self. But that's not all that is there. Verse 17 and, and uh, verse 20. See, they see the sin, but they serve Christ in their mind. Verse 25. See, Paul has already established that none of us, none of those attributes, rather, it even describes an unsaved person. They don't even describe a person who's not a Christian. See, as I, as I stated, Paul uses the present tense verb in verses 14 through 25 which strongly supports the ideal that he is describing his life currently as a Christian. Why, so why do you do that, Paul? Because it refers to the standard of the spiritual and the maturity. See, some of us, we look at it as weak when we're open, honest, and vulnerable. Paul looks at it as we are spiritually healthy and mature as he's dealing with his life as an apostle. See, this standard is when one is open and honest with themselves, they can take off the mask. Get away from the masquerade. Evaluate yourself against the religious, rather the righteous standard of God and not your religious standard that you can put on someone else. See, Paul recognized how we all fall short. How we all have come short of the glory of God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory. See, there's none righteous. No, not one. Brother Bishop, if you were there in, four, in verse 14 of Romans.
Romans 7. For we know mm -hmm. that the law is spiritual. Read. But I am carnal, mm -hmm. so under sin. Mm -hmm. Is that verse 14? Yes. See, the law is spiritual, reflects God's holy character. See, the word carnal is used here, which literally means the flesh. Or the unredeemed man. See, Paul's, uh, Paul does not say he is, now you need to get this. Paul doesn't say he's in the flesh, but the flesh is what? In him. So you need to get that. Because if, if you don't get that, then, then you, you, you're lost in the whole lesson. Paul is saying that he is still in the flesh. But the flesh is in him. You need to get that. See, early on in verse 5, he said, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by law, did works in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. See, that's in the world. That's the non-Christian. Someone will say amen there. See, see, soul under sin, this means that sin no longer controls the whole man. But it holds the Christian member. It holds your member's captivity. The fleshly body is in captivity. See, in Romans 6, 6, Paul says that knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified with him. It says the body of sin might be destroyed. Say, in his fault, we should not serve sin. Amen. See, sin con contaminates. Yes. Contaminates the body. Paul wants you to know while sin is contaminating him, yeah. he is frustrated with his inner desires to obey the will of God. You see the conflict? Mm -hmm. Verse 15. <clears throat> but that which I do, uh -huh. I allow not. Mm -hmm. But what I would, that do I not. Mm -hmm. But what I hate, that do I. Mm. Listen to this. Paul is designed to have an intimate relationship with God. Right. But he is finding himself doing things that does not approve of God. Isn't that something? We're looking to obey God, but sometimes we do things that's not approved by God. Verse 16, quickly. If then I do mm -hmm. that which I would not, mm -hmm. I consent unto the law mm -hmm. that it is good. See, he, he says, I agree with the law. That is good. See, see, Paul's new nature defends the divine standard. See, Paul's not looking at his own standard. He's looking at the standard of God. He says, because it's perfect, righteous law is not responsible for my sin. The law is not responsible for your sin. Amen. Rather, his new self longs to honor the law and to keep it perfect. Yes, Amen. Verse 17. Now then, it is no more I mm -hmm. that do it, mm -hmm. but sin that dwelt in me. No longer I who do it signifies a complete and permanent change. Paul's new inner self the new, he's talking about the I, the new you. Yeah. See, you no longer approve of sin. However, yeah. it still resides in your flesh. Yeah. <laughs> See, sin the, the, uh, dwells in you because, uh, rather, it, it, this means that the sin does not flow out of the new redeemed innermost self, but it's from the unredeemed 
human nature. Right. See, his flesh is in me. He uses the word in me. Verse 18. For I know that in me, mm -hmm. that is in my flesh, mm -hmm. well, no good thing, mm. for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which says good, I find not. Mm. Look at what how he uses the word in me. Nothing's good dwells. See, the flesh serves the, as the base camp for which all sin operates in the Christian life. See, it is, it is not sinfully inherited, but because of the fall of mankind, the flesh is still subject to sin and is contaminated. Verse 20, uh, verse uh, yeah, skip down to verse 22. For I delight in the law of God mm -hmm. after the inward man. Mm. Yeah. I delight in the law of God. See, this means that the believer is justified. The new inner self no longer sides with sin, but joyfully agrees with the law. Who is against him? Look at what Ephesians 3.16 says. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now consider 2 Corinthians 4.16. The Bible says, for which cause we faint not, but through an outward man perish. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. Don't stay in sin. Amen. Because you sin, you don't have to stay in sin. Read verse 23. But I see another law mm -hmm. in my members. Mm -hmm. Or it against the law of my mind. Mm. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, when he speaks of this other law, and I need you to hear this, Master. See, the corresponding spiritual principle to the one in verse 21, this principle is the law of sowing and reaping. See, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. In verse 24, O wretched man that I am, mm -hmm. who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Mm. He says, O wretched man that I am. Then he asked that rhetorical question. Who shall deliver? Well. <laughs> See, in his frustration and grief, Paul understands that the Christian perceives his own sinfulness in direct proportion to how clearly he sees the holiness of God. Well. Mm -hmm. See, he sees it in direct proportion to the perfection of the law. He's constantly using the law to set himself against that standard. I may not be able to reach Brother Bishop's standard, but that's not the standard I need to set for myself. Amen. Also, he uses the word deliver. See, this word means rescue from danger. This was used when a soldier was injured on the battlefield. Paul looks at it as the soldier being pulled from the battlefield. Rescue. When we're doing work in the Lord's church, in the kingdom, there are times when we are overtaken by our fault. See, we need spiritual Christians 
as Paul stated in Galatians 6 1. We, we need some spiritual Christians to rescue us if we are overtaken in our fall. See, Paul looked forward to being rescued. See, see, some of us have a problem with coming down and asking the church to pray for us. Hmm. Do you know that's being rescued? Amen. And he looked forward to being rescued. Verse 25, as he summarizes. I thank God mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, mm -hmm. but with the flesh, the law of sin. Mm. Paul summarizes struggles. He, again, he's not talking about Corinth. He's not talking about the church at Galatia. Amen. He's not talking about the church at 9th Street. Paul is summarizing his struggles in his own mind. See, he is certain that Christ is going to eventually rescue him. Amen. And that there is no other. He can't go just out there in the street, look to the Baptist or the Methodist, um, the Catholic to rescue him. He's looking for Christ Jesus to rescue him. As I close here, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.4. I'm using a new living translation. Look at what Paul says to the Corinth church. He says, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan, sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies. See, they clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed by life. That's right. See, Paul knows that the very God of peace who can sanctify you holy see Paul says I pray I pray God for your whole spirit and the soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ see he knows our members are worn against <coughs> See, sin has deceived us all. Just like in the transference of mankind, the propensity to sin entered the human realm. Mankind became sinners by nature. Satan, who is the father of sin, 1 John 3 8, first brought temptation to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. One through seven. See, Adam then passed the sinful nature to all descendants. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because his descendants, rather his sin, they became the first and disobedience or line of the mankind. It is impossible to live in a way that pleases God with sin in your life. See, for we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the sanctification of the Christian, the word sanctified literally means to be set apart for the Father's will. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. 
Behold, all things are become new. See, isn't it wonderful that first John, rather in John 17, 17, that we are sanctified them in the truth? Your word is truth. See, we're set apart by truth. Isn't it all right that you can read about what we believe in in the word of God? The truth of God. Lastly, the justification of the sovereignty of God. See, the sovereignty of God is defined as God's complete control of everything in the universe. Although we as human can make genuine choices about real consequences, ultimately those choices are either caused or allowed by God in order to accomplish his divine and perfect will. See, God's sovereignty, this means that what he has ordained will come to pass. Because God has the power and the ability to do all that he has planned, especially to benefit those he loves. See, this not only that God loves us, but he has the power and the authority to care for us. Those who are part of the family of God can rest assured that our God not only plans for our good, but he is able to work all things for our good by the power of his will. The transference of mankind, the sanctification of the, of the Christian, and the justification by the sovereignty of God. You see, our justification, sanctification, and glorification are all in the hands of a sovereign God. Amen. The message is yours. Unmasking the Christian. Taking off the masquerade. Seeing me as God sees me. If you are here and realize that your life hasn't been open, honest, you desire to be vulnerable, Christ wants to be in your life. He wants you to be born again and to be born of the water. You may want the Lord to bring all of your sins in captivity. There may be some things that you're doing in your life, in the world, that you can bring those things into captivity. And you're seeking who can deliver you. No one but Christ. You need to put him on in the watery grave of baptism. Amen. See, first you must hear God's word. That's the gospel. That's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Bible says, so then faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's Romans 10, 17. Then you have to believe what you've heard. Bible says, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Then you must repent. Simply means change your life. All those things that you used to do. Now we know, just like every one of us, to step through those doors. We need the Lord because this is his hospital for the sick. Every one of us is sick. We have something going on. And we need the Lord. But we simply need to change from the way that we have been doing things. The Bible says, I tell you, you may. But except you repent, 
You shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Then you must confess. Well, what are we confessing? We're confessing the sweetest name on Mormon tongues. Whosoever therefore should confess me before men, him I will also, I will confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Then lastly, you put him on in the water and grave of baptism for the remission of sin. See, when you go down in that water, there's blood in that water. You don't see it, but it cleanses you. You rise a new person, a new creature in Christ. And then for those of us who are Christians, need to make some alterations in our life, didn't quite do some things that we know we should have done, can't quite bring our sins into captivity. Step out on faith. Come on down. Repentance and prayer restores you back. As I close here, I want to close in Luke 12. Luke 12, if you would get that book. Verses 1 through 5. Luke 12, verses 1 through 5. Is it okay if I come here? In the meantime, we are gathered together mm -hmm. and a new multitude of people, mm -hmm. insomuch as they troll one upon another. Mm -hmm. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, mm -hmm. hold right there. Luke is writing about a situation that had occurred to this to about Jesus and his disciples. What Luke is saying, when Jesus went forward and he's telling his disciples, there was a great multitude. There were thousands of individuals that were gathering together. And in that multitude was some Pharisees. Now, if you understand about the Pharisees and you're a Bible student, you know that those Pharisees didn't mean any good for Jesus nor those disciples. Go back to verse 1 as the multitude was gathered. They together a new multitude of people. Mm -hmm. So much. Mm -hmm. They drove one upon another. Stop right there. There were so many people that were gathering. They were stepping on one another's toes and shoes. You know how we act. Someone step on. We're ready to fight. But there were so many that they were stepping on one another. And the Pharisees, they always got a plan. But Jesus is trying to warn his disciples. Yeah. Read. Watch what they do. Beware. Mm -hmm. He of the leaven of the Pharisees. Jesus is saying, beware of these Pharisees. Which beware you know? of the leaven of the Pharisees. You've heard of the scriptures, a little leaven, leaven the whole lump, brother. He said, beware of them. Why, Jesus? Uh huh. Hypocrisy. He said they're contaminated. He said they're phony, they're contaminated, and they're hypocrites. They sit around, they come together, and they'll say some things in private, and then say something different in public. Masquerade as Christians. Read. There's nothing covered mm. that should not be revealed, mm -hmm. neither hid, mm -hmm. that should not be known. Oh, right. See, the Lord knows all. But these Pharisees, they come together 
in those meetings before the meetings, the meetings after the meetings, the meetings in the parking lot, those FaceTime and the conferences that you have when you're on your way home, <laughs> when you get ready to uh, cook the chicken before you eat the chicken or cook the preacher, <laughs> those meetings, they were doing things in secret. Doing things in secret. Jesus warned them about their hypocritical ways, being phony. Read. Therefore, uh -huh. whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness mm -hmm. shall be heard in the light. Mm -hmm. That which ye have spoken in the air mm -hmm. in the closets mm -hmm. shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Oh. See, some of us, <coughs> some of us even get in our closets and we pray to the Lord about the things that we should do and praying for sisters and brothers who, are, who may be ill and praying for even our own self. And then we come through those doors thinking that I'm all right. Lord is taking care of that. But what you find out is that the Lord reveals those things. After a while, see, we know, you know, you're going to come with this. You're going to act a certain kind of way. And then we know those same things is going to permeate, not only throughout the rooftop, but it's going to be throughout the world. See, God knows those things. And if you're doing evil things, and then asking the Lord, you know, to try to, oh, I need you to take Brother Bishop out. He didn't quite treat me well. He didn't have a kind word for me. Lord, you know him. Take care of it. See, the Lord will